Hey, Julie. Just a couple people in and connecting. Um, but it does look like, um, John, that we have you, Nick, Tony, Pam, and Heather. And I, I'm not expecting Rachel. I'm pretty sure um, she said she couldn't make it tonight. So feel free to open the meeting when you're ready. All right. Um, let's call this meeting a CPDC to order. Um, Julie, do you need to have you hit record? Um, I will right now. All right. Um, and so this meeting is recorded. It's available via Zoom. There is a link that's on the um, CPDC webpage on the town website. And also the link is provided on the agenda that was posted. This is a public meeting. So there will be members of the public attending. Um, the, CPDC, the typical process for the CPDC is to um, uh, have the applicant give a presentation and then the CBDC members will ask questions and then um, once their questions are answered, open it up for public comment. So for anyone here from the public, if you don't mind um, refraining from speaking until uh, you're acknowledged by the chair, that would be great. If you do want to make a comment at any time, you can um, just use the raise hand feature in Zoom, which is located at the bottom of your screen if you click on participants. Um, there is a ellipsis at the very bottom of the screen and that should give you the option to raise your hand and I will be monitoring that so I will alert the chair when the time is appropriate um, that you want to make a comment and then he will acknowledge you and um, can take it from there. Um, if everyone else will remain muted um, unless you're speaking that would be great. Um, and from the CPDC tonight here we have John Weston who's the chair, we have Nick Safina, Pamela Adrian, Heather Klisch, and Tony Diaretto. Um, so I think that's all. And from staff, I'm Julie Mercier, Community Development Director, and we have Andrew, Andrew Nichols, staff planner with us. So I think that's all from me. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, so we, um, well, first, thanks to um, uh, everyone on CPDC for, um, for clearing the schedule uh, for this meeting that was not originally scheduled. Um, but I, did, I think that um, probably everyone would agree that uh, that it was prudent to try and get this on the schedule and address the timeliness of, of this um, particular application. So thank you, first of all. Um, and so we really have uh, uh, only one item, uh, one true item on the agenda, although after this, right, there's a couple of things that I think we want to talk through um, uh, with Julie. But so um, the item is a public hearing for a site plan review at um, uh, 100 General Way, or also known as 100 General Way. Um, we have a um, we have a um, public notice that needs to be read, um, and. Um, uh, secretary typically reads that. Is that Heather? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't remember. Who, we just what did it. Is organized. it Pam? Is it? I think it's Pam. But uh, Andrew, did, do you did you provide can you, the public? Can you bring that up, Andrew? I'll stop my screen share. One second. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Notice is hereby given that under sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, September 9th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. through remote and online measures to hear the site plan review application for a change of use submitted by Alphabest SNLU for the property located at one general way, assessors map 17, lot 12. The applicant is proposing to utilize the existing approximately 18,500 square foot space that was formerly Gold's Gym for a for-profit early education center to provide academic athletic support and programming to families. 
A copy of the application and a company plans are available to the public by the town hall by appointment and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. And I will now recuse myself as in a butter. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Um, who do we have? Uh, well, Julie, do you want to start off with something or should we just turn it straight over to the applicant? We can turn it over to the applicant. Um, it looks like I can just let you know who's here. It looks sure. like the applicant team we have Earl McFadden, um, Joe Finnegan, Bill Robichaud, um, Jody Hayward is from uh, Dennis Properties, the management company is on their way um, site. And so she's not technically from the applicant team. Mm -hmm. um, today. Um, and then we have Ron Rainier, who's the architect. And I hope I didn't miss anybody. Please chime in if I did. Thank you. So um, I, I don't know who, um, who can start, but really I think what we, uh, uh, thank you for pulling all that inf the information together um, that you that you supplied um, you know some of it was is uh, I'm going to say within CPDC um, uh, realm some of it not but it, it all definitely um, helps us understand what um, what you're planning on doing and how this this whole thing is is starting to come together um, I, I know that uh, some of that, some of the material is still a work in progress as you're you're trying to get this um, pulled together, probably in some record time. Um, uh, and so I see this as uh, you know, if you can um, lay out what you what you have, um, and we can talk through any of the issues that CPDC might have um, uh, or, or questions. Um, I think really focusing. Um, on, I really want to focus on the site plan aspects of it. I, I understand that you may still have some evolving issues on how, what needs to be done inside the building. Um, and, um, and I'm sure you, you all will work through those before you, um, before you open up. But really, I want to focus on the, on the outside of the building and the site plan itself. To me, the the main focus is uh, 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 is the site drop off, uh, the the drop off and pick up, um, but along with that, just sort of a uh, if you could provide an overview of what your plans are, so we can sort of understand the the pace of sort of uh, kids being dropped off and picked up, and um, and what else we might um, w might impact that um, that site circulation. Um, this is Carl McFadden. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for, uh, I know these are crazy times for us to be able to um, you know, make this uh, meeting happen. And I want to obviously thank uh, Julie because she's been uh, very, very accommodating as well as Andrew, as all the town officials, because uh, obviously in this pandemic time, we've had to probably put it's something that normally takes uh, a couple months to take place to get it done in, in um, two weeks, uh, two or three weeks time frame. Um, I do have our, uh, Ron Renier, who is our architect that's been working um, with the town, as well as Billy Brobachad, my, my partner, um, as well as Joe Finnegan, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, was a, a former Reading High School and Parker Middle School principal. Um, what SNL has done is that we've, we've looked at, and the most important thing is we're not, with what we're presenting is something that the community has been, is desperately looking to do is, as everyone is aware, is that um, all the children in town are now 100% remote except for kindergarten. And what we're doing is using what SNL does as well as uh, Alphabet, who's a national education is, um, teaching company, along with Joe Finnegan where we're providing uh, for the community a remote learning uh, facility, where instead of, to, to break it down to the most basic terms, is what we're doing is, instead of a child being at home learning, um, you know, on 
online. Uh, they're coming to us, which is the uh, obviously the old Reading, um, excuse me, the Reading Athletic Club Gold Gym. Um, they're learning at this. They're learning at that site with academic support that we have uh, for people to help the children, so that people are able to go to work. Um, the exciting thing for us is the fact that the community has. Uh, um, how do I phrase it in terms of they welcome it with open arms because parents are like, I just want to be a mom and dad. I don't want necessarily want to be a teacher uh, because after what happened in the springtime, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of fighting with my kid, uh, my child in terms of do, uh, figuring it out. So we're not looking to, we're not here to replace the writing school system whatsoever. What we're really looking to do is to enhance the educational experience and obviously Joe Finnegan, uh, would be able to jump in and be able to talk about that aspect of it. Um, we've had a couple different meetings with all of the DRT team on site as well as online to go over that. And Dr. Darty, who's been on, on the call as recently as yesterday, and we have a meeting tomorrow morning with him. All we're looking to do is get be allow people to go back to work and, and give the kids a, a structured environment for them to be able to um, to educate to be able to get there and uh, I, the the most basic terms is the fact that what we're doing is the kids when they're doing their their school day um, they're online we've gone through all the all the different um, requirements that the state has has put in place as it's a shall we say it's a it's a moving target at all times which is which is exciting um, is the fact that the state is really embracing something like this. And um, so it's the, the most, again, basic aspect of it is instead of a child sitting at their kitchen table trying to learn, they're in a structured environment with academic support to keep them motivated for grades one to six um, it, so that the parents are able to go to work and they're in a, a safe, structured environment. Um, Ron Ranieri, uh, who's a, a Reading resident, has been working with um, Julie and her staff, as well as all, all the members of the DRT to go over the drop off and um, pick up situation. I know that's probably the most important thing on the CPTC. I know Andrew today gave me a list of different questions that may or may not be relevant to this conversation, but um, essentially, and is what we're, it's a normal school day and um, I will let Ron go from here because I think the pick up and drop off obviously is, a, is the most important aspect of it. And really what we're doing is replicating what takes place on the wood end school site in terms of pick up and drop off because of the way that is constructed, uh, the way it is set up because of it's so, because of the uh, neighborhood that's gone through there. Um, I have firsthand experience having been on the school committee during the construction as well as um, the, the pick up and drop off that came up when I was um, on the school committee at acting chair at the time of that so I'm very familiar with that. Um, we, we have actually a special thing is because uh, Joe Finnegan's wife is actually runs the front office of Wood End so, so we have a very good way of understanding Wood End pick up and drop off that we can replicate to be able to, um, you know, obviously work through um, the one general way, the 100 general way uh, location so that it's not um, any form of a, a, a burden, shall we say, to, to the community backing up to Main Street whatsoever. Um, so with that, I guess, I, you know, I guess we can tackle the general questions if there are any on, um, the site and what we're doing, uh, but I, were, I guess probably the easiest way to start it off was ask Ron Ranieri to, who's the architect, can kind of go through the, the pick up and drop off um, scenario and I can, I can chime in as well as our team um, after his presentation, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that sounds right, so okay. Ron. I had to unmute my audio, I had my audio on mute. Um, so let me share my, share my screen with you, which will be the, um, 
the site plan. So this is the existing site plan. And what I do is I drew cars on there to represent what the drop off and pick up queues will look like. And prior to today, we thought we were prior to the GRT meeting, we thought we were going to have one GRT meeting was yesterday, that one. Uh, we thought we were going to have just one drop off point, which would have been on the south side of the building. But during the GRT meeting, there was a lot of concern about how long the queue would be extending out to Main Street. So um, we looked at this again this morning and said, okay, we can add another queue so that we would have two entrances. So now we have an entrance on the north, the south side of the building, which is up here, which was the original entrance that was approved by the police department. And now we're adding another door. There's an existing door right here on the building, uh, which is, this is the front of the building right here to orient you. And so this is general way coming around here coming down and heading towards Market Basket, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we did was we said, let's use this entrance that's existing, uh, has a sidewalk and bright light, and let's use that as a drop off point as well. And so what would happen now, the two queues, if you were coming down the, from uh, Main Street, and that's the way we expect to enter the site. We don't expect to enter the site uh, from like the uh, North Street area. Uh, so, you would come down general way and you would, let me back up a little bit. What Carl and the team is going to do, the SNLU is going to do, is they're going to assign uh, each parent to an entrance. So there'll be two entrances, we expect a hundred kids. So there'll be 50 kids or 50 parents dropping off kids at each entrance. So if you are selected to go to the south entrance, you would come down general way and you would pull in here and these little rectangles, which might be hard to see. Let me expand this a little bit. Excuse me, Brian, are you doing that? This is worst case scenario in terms of we, we have a, based on registration so far, we have a ton of parents that have multiple children. So it would be one car. So where we had, where, you know, Ron referenced 50, um, excuse me, 100 cars, it, it certainly won't be that because we're running probably about 20, 20 to 25% of all parents have multiple children based on the registration so far. And even as a regular school drop off, like I know when I dropped my kids off at uh, Parker in the high school, there was always more than my kids in my car. We were always carpooling, so we all didn't have to drop off every single day. Uh, but basically, um, these little rectangles represent a car. So it's- a Sorry, I'm not seeing that anymore. I'm just seeing yeah. uh, meeting house screen. We're, we're seeing the wrong screen here. Oh, what's going on? I think you gotta hit the, there's a button called return to meeting. I think maybe that's what you gotta hit. Ron. I'm looking for a button that says return to meeting. Orange button, top left of the four panels there, to left of the clock. There you yep, go. That's it. Okay, so my computer was, uh, was the wheel was spinning because I was enlarging the drawing a little bit. Can oh, you see it's it? It's back. It's back. The, the drawing is back? No, the return to meeting is back. Okay, give it a second. My computer is going very slowly. I did a very stupid thing earlier. At 6.30, I started to update my computer because oh. the, uh, figured I would restart my computer. I didn't plan to update it. Figured I would restart my desktop computer so I wouldn't have any problems with the Zoom meeting. And then it's been updating Windows since 6.30. So, um, well, we're, so well, we're waiting for that. Um, one question I had for you, Carl, and sure. uh, maybe you have some of this info while you're getting registrations is, um, right, you, you'll have, or I, I think you're gonna have like an early, uh, uh, early session, the, sort of the core day and then extended or, is it really yeah. the early isn't early because it's mostly is it mostly parents? I'm trying to get a sense of you sure. know, like it. You, you say uh, right, hundred students. Let's say right. um, let's say really all of them have you know a hundred students but fifty cars. But on top of that, not all are going to come crashing in at the same time, right? Correct. There's, there's some yep. um, there's some staggering naturally. 
Um, so what's your sense on that at this point? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It, it. One quick side note, Julie, tremendous eyes on, on your child there. Just beautiful eyes. But um, all of a sudden I see her there. Um, the school day obviously replica is, is exactly the Reading school day, which starts at 8 o'clock, um, 8 to 2.30, 2.45 there. Some parents have requested at 7 a.m. because they got to catch a train, um, you know, at 7.20, 7.30 out of the depot. Uh, so really from 7 to 7.45, it's a 45-minute window where parents will be dropping their children off. Mm -hmm. uh, our school day goes when I say school day in terms of it, it it's the Reading school system day. Uh, in one side note, every single child is from Reading. So it's not like we're taking any Wakefield or North Reading or Linfield or anything like that. These are all Reading kids. So the, we're handling just the, um, uh, it's the Reading school day from eight, eight to, as I mentioned, two thirty ish. Um, so during a 45 minute window, because what we're asking all the parents to do is show up by, have their child at the site by 745 so that we're able to log in, you know, help the kids log in from their laptop uh, or tablet or whatever the case may be. So it's really over a 45 minute window, the parents can drop their child off uh, at the different sites, um, but they're, they're designated in terms of site A or site B. Um, you know, where it's 50 going to one door, potentially, and 50 going to the other door um, from that aspect of it. As Ron's computer is coming up and running, um, part of the new, uh, unfortunately, the, the new world we're dealing with is that parents have to answer the four COVID questions, you know, anyone sick in their house, the whole nine yards. So we actually have, will have um, three staff members on each side, so that's six people um, outside, it's kind of, <laughs> I hate to use this, uh, the analogy, but if anyone's been over to Chick-fil-A in Woburn, where, <laughs> where, which by the way, they've mastered the drive through They have. That's the best model going, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> where what is essentially in terms of the three cars, you know, people are in line, three people, you know, are three people per side. Uh, the parents are, you know, answer the questions, you know, which is no, 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 no. Otherwise they, they can't really come, they can't come into the site. We take the children out, the child out or children, what, uh, bring them right to the, to the, to our side door, which is literally three feet away and then moving along. So within 30 seconds per on each side, we're able to remove, um, you know, six kids to come into our facility so that we're not, you know, dealing with any backup you know, kind of like the running joke that we've had is that we can get a child out of a car quicker than Bagel World can make a bagel. Um, so we, we want to obviously be able to get the, the kids in and out, but it's over a 45 minute period. Um, and to keep it in context, you know, every Reading public school, even the middle school and the high school, they're, they're bringing in just, again, it's based on, on our moment, you know, what where it's at Parker Coolidge, which has 600 kids, or, or Reading High that has 1,200 kids, or the elementary school that has 300. We're, we're just dealing with 100 children, not necessarily 100 cars, but 100 children. So let's say by using based off numbers, let's say it's 80 cars. So it would be off, you know, 40 cars on each side of, of the facility. Again, six staff members taking children out of the car, answering the COVID questions. Um, and be able to get them in and out realistically in 30 seconds per car at three cars per time, if, if that makes sense. Um, Ron, it does appear I'll let you jump back in because your computer's updated or but I don't see any more of return to main screen on my screen. So I'll let you continue. Okay. Unfortunately, this is a very large file and it seems like if I move it or enlarge it, it takes a few minutes to refresh. But what I was talking about was these rectangles up here. These are uh, represent cars. They're 20 feet long, so it represents a car plus some space between the cars. And so what that means is we can get 18 cars stationary within this area of the parking lot. Um, so obviously they're not going to be stationary. They're going to be moving through very quickly. And if they don't uh, come through to this doorway, if they're selected to come to the north side of the building, then they would come down general way and come into the parking lot. And I'm reluctant to move the screen again because it's gonna take a while to refresh. Um, so the 
they're going to come into the parking lot and queue up in front of this door and then leave out here and go back onto General Way, either left or right, depending on where they're going afterwards. Same back in this parking lot. Uh, when they leave the parking lot, they would go back to General Way and either go towards Main Street or towards Walkersville Drive. So that's basically the drop-off situation. It seems to, to be able to work very well from a car point of view, as well as the interior of the building. And, and uh, Chairman, one of the, the positives for us is that um, the closest tenant is uh, Liquor Junction, uh, which is you know probably a quarter of a mile or at least 300 yards away. So th there are no other tenants in, our, in that area. Uh, to the right that will have customers or uh, employees that have to park there. So it's kind of a, a desolate area, um, which, which is obviously ideal for us um, in terms of we're not having asking the parents to, you know, kind of maneuver around existing employees' cars or anything like that. I have a couple of questions. This is obviously the, the scale of resolution is a little funky. So what I want to understand is on the south side, right? You're going to have a sidewalk or something between the cars and the building. They're not going to be right up against the building, right? There is no sidewalk currently existing there. Well, you're going to have a clear zone, a clear space. Well, what they'll do is they'll put cones down to keep the cars away from the building. Well, what happens in the winter when they're plowing and stuff? I think you need something there to mark that yeah. separation. Yeah. Again, one of the things that when uh, we did the DR team was up. Lieutenant Amendola from the Reading Police Department um, had had originally recommended. Well, she did. She has recommended the where it says 18 car queue, uh, and we've actually added uh, the 11 car queue at area because you literally pull up right where the door is. Um, we won't, um, you know, in terms of the, there's no sidewalk there except in the very front of the um, of the building just the way it's physically laid out there okay but I, I don't I don't necessarily mean a raised sidewalk with a granite curb what I'm saying is that I don't like the idea of the car being the first car being in the line of the pedestrian as they're trying to get in the door and so there should be some separation between the car yeah. and the building wall yeah I, I, if they're, you know you know what's going to happen is um, the kid's going to get sick or something like in the car and the person's going to have to take off and they're going to pull out of the queue and, and move or rush or potentially, you know, something else happens, whatever. But sure. you, know, just, you can't risk having them in line with the pedestrian. So you need some sort of a clearance between the, the car and the building face. Yeah, However you mark that with, whether it's cones or, you know, something taller maybe than a cone just so that it's it's visible. We, we, could, we could put up some temporary plastic blockades or cones. Yeah, yeah I think I think you should do that. Just give yourself some some space there. The other question is to the uh, hold on. So so the, to the west of this queue is a loading bay that at times has vehicles in it, you know, larger trucks or whatever. And I'm curious what happens if that's in use. This whole queue has to move, you know, 40 feet east. Yeah. Right? I mean, the aerial picture that you included in your submittal shows a a large truck inside that dock. Sure. Um, is is Jody Jody from uh, Hayward from uh, Danis Corporation the the landlord? Jody, are you on the line there? Hmm. She was on earlier. She was there earlier. Um, okay. Well, I'd be able to answer that. The only tenant they have back there. there is she she's still, still there? there. She's just, uh, I think she's got to click on the, the unmute button there. Um, the tenant that's back there is an awning company, a gentleman that obviously provides awning. And um, during that time, he he is not there from, from my understanding, but it's just one gentleman that does, you know, he has a, uh, I don't want to say a pickup, but, you know, that that's the only vehicle in that area. Um, Barriers, you know, is obviously very desolate. Um, Hi, it's Jody. Can you hear me? There she is. There she is. All right, Jody, you can you can talk about uh, the loading dock area if you could. Sorry, I joined on the phone and it wouldn't let me unmute. So my apologies. Um, yes, there is a tenant that's an awning tenant, and they use that loading dock 
we reviewed this with them. The fire department actually reviewed it with them. And they said most of their deliveries are in the morning before noon. So we actually forwarded an email from Ju to Julie where they said that they didn't need to participate tonight and that we'd make this work. They didn't see an issue with what we were proposing. Um, it, it, Jody, you know, it's Carl, could you, um, it's, it's, uh, is it a single part? Like they only have one truck? Running, or well, is it a they have one of their, I believe they have one truck. So they come in earlier in the morning, they load it and then their company, their people go out to do their installs. And then they may receive some materials before noon that they would take in the loading dock. Is that a condition that you might impose though? My concern only is that if, if there is a vehicle there, and again, deliveries get delayed, snow or weather or whatever, you know, the job's running late. If there's a vehicle in that loading bay, it just pushes the queue up, that's all. So sure. somehow you need to resolve that or account for it. Yes. Uh, so, so these spaces that are on the more, sorry, I just have a few more questions about this particular issue, but the, the spaces that are on the um, southernmost edge, right? So the, the top ones waiting to turn so they can come down to the building. That's clear of the lane, the, the vehicle, the traffic lane that's happening along the fence. Is that right? Yeah. Is that the if, idea if, there? Yeah. If you look at it in terms of... Um... You can see it, it's running concurrent with the the outside of the building, and it, the okay. lane that goes to Market Basket or whatever. People, it's running parallel with the, uh, railroad tracks. You can okay. see how our lane doesn't go above, and using this reference of the picture, above the building, uh, the line of the building. Which sure. Okay. But are, is that going to be marked? I mean, are these spaces going to be marked somehow? Or is there going to be a, a signage or some sort of direction yeah. that lets people understand what to do? Yeah, well, one of the things that we spoke with the police department, which they, they were excellent on, it, it, well, first of all, they're going to put their portable traffic saying, you know, slow down or you're going too fast or whatever the case may be, as well as um, the landlord, Jody, in this particular case, their representative, is going to put in maybe a, a um, like a speed bump or something to, to make sure people obviously are going slow. But and additional signage that children in the area, just so people know the use. Yeah, right. that's great. That's great and everything, but here's what I'm concerned about. So that, by the but, way, that is, that byway is pretty fast. People buzz down there. Here's yeah. the thing, if you don't mark these spaces and these but, people park too far north, they can't make that turn, which means they're gonna back up, right? When, when you're saying a turn in terms of going left at the stop sign? No, no, no. You have this queue of cars at the yeah. top of the page, correct? Going are, to the left. Yeah. They're going yeah. to the left. And then they turn when it's their time to get to the door. They're going to turn oh, the saying. car and come along the building phase. If they're too far north, they can't make that turn in one move. Right. That's why well, I was asking if you could yeah. somehow mark this. Yeah, well, we were gonna, what our plan was was that we'd be putting orange cones, uh, pylon. Mm -hmm wherever they end up calling them uh, along that way so that everyone knows, you know, don't, don't go over, don't go past right, obviously the pylon. So yeah, we would end up doing that, you know, every single morning, every single afternoon so that people have plenty of room to get by. There, there won't be an issue there. So. Okay. But I, I, I still think you should send Mark where the cones go so that the employees putting them out there don't get lazy and sort of sneak it in a little bit. I'm just, <laughs> I really don't want cars backing up. Right. That's the yeah. first thing. No, you absolutely. Do. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we will, what we'll end up doing is, uh, you know, once there's approval there, we will put, or Joni will, uh, Jody will, um, put like orange dot staff knows every single day you put the, do you put the cone on the dot. Uh, from there, and you know, we would welcome uh, the town staff or the police department, whomever, come down there and you know, say, all right, this is the appropriate place for the dot for us to be able to do. Okay, so on the on the um, north drop off, the eleven car queue, why isn't that going the other way? Right now, you've got the potentially the child coming out of the car on the traffic side. It's like you're you're pulling into the spot yes. and going to the right, but you're sending the child out, you know, on the other side. Uh, because one of the questions, and Ron can certainly jump in, was that the concern was that the eleven cars, if they were going across the front of the building, 
which was where the gym entranceway was, was that we'd end up being creating a, a traffic jam for, um, uh, you know, backing up in the Walker's Book Drive, as well as um, the, the school-age children that we have from grades one to six, they wouldn't be sitting in the front seat, obviously, because um, that's not obviously recommended for, you know, elementary school children. So they would be getting in the back seat behind the parents uh, of the driver's seat. So that way they'd be able to get in that way. Yeah. Um, right. It doesn't work at all. Try and come in they the they wouldn't be in the driver's side passenger seat at all. Parents put their children in the back seat. Yeah, so, well, you said that you have families with two kids. They're going to be both sides of the back seat. Well, with they, you know, they, they, they crawl across, you know, the, you know, we're going to have plenty of minivans <laughs> typically. And so they would, uh, or just they open the sliding door and they both jump into the, to that side of it. So you're, you're removing the parking. Is that what's happening there? You're going to remove that parking that's along that top edge? No, there is no, there are no tenants there right now. So the parking stripes will stay, but we'll be put, we'll be okay. in the lane between the parking spots. Yeah. That, that used to be the old baby furniture warehouse where who's no, no longer a tenant there. So it's. No, I understand, but you're, you're showing the cars sort of up against the, I don't want to say the sidewalk instead of, are you going to pull into the parking spots or are you going to stay in the traffic lane? No, you pull right against the sidewalk. So the stripes that are there going perpendicular to the building, uh, I don't know if they'll be eliminated or not, but we won't, won't be using them. There won't be any cars parked perpendicular. Okay. But you're going to pull in that far. That's what I was asking. Right, right. So they'll pull in right. In. right to, that's those uh, where the car shows, they're directly against the sidewalk. The other thing to remember here is that these are the same people coming every day. It's not like a shopping center parking lot where it's different people all the time. So after a first couple of times they come here, they'll all be very used to how to pull in, pull in and pull out of this place. That's true. And, and you said you're going to assign people to a door, but uh, are you actually going to have a list of students to come to that door? Because you know that they're going to break protocol yeah. at some point, right? No, parents won't do that. Uh, <laughs> What, yeah, what it, what it does is every single, you know, obviously we, we're, we're assumption based on what, you know, people are, we're going to have the same parents every, every single week, or, you know, maybe 95% of the same parents every single week. So what we'll end up doing again in the ideal world is like last name A through L, um, if there were, if that was 50 of them would go to the top parking lot and then M, M through Z would go to the bottom. Um, yeah, I know. But when, when that, when that breaks down, and it will, how are you going to deal with it so that there isn't a long delay that starts to back up the queue? That's what I'm asking, really. Like, how are you going to deal with that? Do you have an electronic check-in system? Um, how are you going to know that that student's supposed to be there? Well, one of the things, well, the drop-off is one aspect, of, but the pickup, every, uh, each parent will be very similar to the wood end scenario in terms of they'll have a, a big placard um, card with their last name, the child's name, last name on the dashboard. So when they're pulling in, um, you know, our staff is out there saying, all right, the Jones kid is, you know, coming, you know, we need to get Jones or Finnegan, you know, whatever the children's name is, they're going to be, we're going to be, you know, the walkie talkie system so that they're just like Wood End uh, Elementary School. So that when the people show up, their kids waiting for them right there. Okay, that's pickup. Yeah. Uh, I my concern was just drop off that if somebody drops off at the north door and they were expected at the well, south door that there's a delay in being able to process that. But you're we'll saying have, you see the we'll partner. have the full Nick, we'll have the full roster at, at both doors, um, sure. and then what we'll do is we'll sort it and say, okay, south door, you're A through L. Here's M through Z in the back in case you know uh, Matthews shows up uh, at the south door. Um, even but, though they were supposed to go to the north door. Yeah, okay. and, and, and Nick, one of the additional questions, you know, we, everyone, our, our staff has the tablets where we have everyone's name because um, obviously in the new world that we're living in, everyone has to answer the four COVID questions. So we're able to pull up right then and there, you know, Jones, okay. no, 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 and, the, and then they move on. Nice that, you know, we spoke with yesterday while he was on, on the DRT call, his, um, because one of the things that we're, we were actually looking to do was do the temperature check on each kid, you know, do the forehead there. And the, 
the school systems are not actually not doing that because the COVID, uh, excuse me, the temperature check is unreliable. So, which is, you know, good and bad for us in terms of um, we're able to get the kids out of the car even faster because we don't have to stop to take the temperature check. Um, but th so we're able to handle that aspect of it. So it's really the parents answer the four, four COVID questions, which, you know, the Reading school system's going to have to ask all their kids too, which, um, you know, with us having multiple drop-offs versus some of the elementary schools, I, I, I don't believe they're, they're hopefully going to be able to have multiple drop-offs, but you know, the, I'd like, for instance, Birchman, I don't know how they're going to do multiple drop-offs there, but with us, we had, because of this, the way the facility is set up, we're going to be able to have multiple drop-offs to get, you know, only, only a hundred kids in and out quickly, as opposed to, you know, three or 400 kids that are going to an elementary school. I could, but I could just say a word too, please. Joe Finnegan, thank you everybody for having us. Um, having experience as I was assistant principal at the old high school, I was principal at Parker, I was principal at the high school during the construction project, and I was actually principal over at Woburn. You know, I've done a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of time on the curb, drop off and pick up, and a couple of different things is one is it's safe, first and foremost, and the other piece is it reasonable. The other piece is um, in any drop off and pick up for any school, you know, parents want it to work. Here, I think, you know, we're, we're, parents here are going to be our customers, okay? So they're really motivated for the, to make this thing work. So uh, as far as being compliant and accessible, I think that, uh, I think that uh, we'll work, work well as a team. I mean, again, it goes back to what the safety is. And, and just taking in the comments here and fine tuning the proposal, I think is terrific. Okay, thanks. I know that was a lot of questions. Those are the easy ones, though. So keep going. <laughs> well, and this, this is Heather. I just want to chime in and say, is it safe to assume that you'll be communicating with all of the parents? So if you know, after the first couple of weeks, it's not going super smoothly, you can remind parents, let your kids out on the safe side. And right. um, I'm assuming that all the parents will also have a strong interest in moving through swiftly because they've got trains to catch and work to get to. Yeah. Um, Heather, the, based on the fact that typically every conversation with the over 100 parents that have called me, that every conversation has gone 40 minutes, <laughs> they're extremely vested in this as well as um, we're, we're pretty confident, obviously, that we're going to be able to get, get people through in order to get, right. um, you know, for people to get to trains or, or whatever the case may be. But obviously, you know, safety is the most important thing. But again, every single minute so in in theory you know we're going to be able to get anywhere from eight to ten cars uh out of there you know through in and out per minute so you know the maximum and again that's if everyone shows up at one time which you know some parents have said i i'm going to drop my kid off at 7 45 so he'll be set up i've had other parents say to me i'm going to drop him off um, because I got to be into Boston by eight o'clock. It's, it's seven, seven o'clock. So worst case scenario, if everyone, a hundred cars showed up, no multiple children whatsoever, we can clear that whole space in, in around five to eight minutes is the way we're looking at it. And, um, again, we're using the same exact model that the elementary schools do. Well, certainly Wood End does. I don't know about the other elementary schools in town. But I, I guess one of the other thing, I'm sorry, Heather, was that we are constantly speaking with the parents because uh, the way we're, we're setting it up is that it's on a week by week basis of people, you know, signing up. So we're always letting them know what's going on and the rules that they need to follow. And parents are extremely motivated because you know, we've heard a lot of horror stories, which we're not going to get into today of people like worrying about losing their job if they don't have a place for their child to go to. Um, so they're extremely motivated to make sure that this is there, that this is happening, I would say. So this is a long-term plan here, long-term solution, not just during this <laughs> pandemic, I'm asking. The, yeah, the, great question. Our arrangement with uh, Dennis is as long as the writing schools are 100% remote, and I don't think anybody knows that based on the number of COVID uh, 
teachers and higher education have taken, which the, it is the right to the 12 week COVID leave. We've been told that we need to plan on um, preparing to handle this till June 30th. And I, I know this is a public comment and I, I'm sure parents would be you know, <laughs> getting nervous. I think the, I have not heard and you know, Mr. Joe Finnegan can, it can jump in there. There's been zero discussion, zero discussion about having all the students 100% back in the schools. The best case scenario is a hybrid model, which is fine because a hybrid model that they're using, the, the plan would be to do like what they call a vocational model where the kids are in school one week, out of school the next week, which in this case, we'd have kids would come to us one week and then a whole set of new kids would come in the next week. Um, but there has been zero discussion of, you know, between the teachers union, well, it's just, I guess, the world in general, you know, because there's, you turn on the news and every night they're talking about teachers. Uh, I mean, you saw what happened up in Andover where the teachers won't even go in the building. Uh, so what happens if Danis wants to rent out this future tenant space here? Well, we, we, yeah, I mean, we have a lease with them. Um, so, you know, we have a legal agreement with Danis um, to be able to fill this, you know, that, that it's our space. Um, but knock on wood, you know, hopefully there's a vaccine or whatever the case may be that this would be purely like an eight to not eight to nine month, um, solution for parents. And that by worst case scenario, again, worst case scenario, next September, life is back to normal, shall we say. But we, just, uh, if we I may, have, Jody Hayward here, um, our goal obviously is to get retail tenants. They... Carl came to us, the town asked for our help. So we're looking to help the town. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, you're all familiar with this site. Um, I don't see a lot of retailers coming out to you know, open new stores. So I think the timing works. Um, we are still actively looking for long-term tenants. As you know, we're looking for people that are gonna succeed and be there for years to come. We're not looking just to put somebody in that's not gonna make it. It's a significant investment and we're looking for the right fit, but. You know, we hope this helps the town of Reading, um, and it seems like a great solution to help the residents of Reading. Yeah. I and, have a couple and, of other quick questions. Oh, when, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Carl, go ahead. No, that's okay. One of the things, again, um, part of our uh, arrangement uh, with Dennis is the fact that if, however ha it happens, where if Dr. Darty says, all right, the kids are 100% uh, back in school, then, you know, I don't want to say we're out of business because <laughs> we essentially would be, is that, um, you know, we pack up and, and, and go home, shall we say. So I'm sorry, Heather, go ahead. No, it's okay. Just a couple of other quick questions. One is on that, um, the, I, on, on the diagram, the top side, the 18 car queue is, well, assuming we get some snow this year, is the plan to have that entire area cleared of snow? And if not, how, how much do you think that'll impact that drop off? Um, well, there's not going to be any snow this year, Heather. I, I, I can't call <laughs> on that. It's there, but but in terms of uh, snow removal, it is um, I don't know if Jody's able yep. to. Jump. As you know, if you're familiar with the site, we spend a fortune to keep that place well plowed and no piles. So right. that has never been a location to store um, snow because it was always operating as a health club for the most recent years. So that would be free and clear of snow. Okay, and then my other one is just confirming an assumption. I, based on the registrations that you're getting, I'd be, I, I'd just love to confirm, I'm guessing that, that the kids will be picked up at staggered times, depending on when the parents yep. are done, not that we won't necessarily have a, a rush at 5.30. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, the pickup is uh, gonna be from three to 6 p.m. So it's a three hour window and um, I don't know if any of you you've had children that have gone to the, the extended day program that the school system runs, where um, at three o'clock you have, you know, whatever, 30 or 40 kids at a, at a school. And then it's, it's like a drip campaign in terms of parents showing up, depending on if they're stuck in traffic or not. By the time you hit five o'clock, you have like two kids left. Um, so it's a much more controlled, I, I'm using the word controlled, um, pick up because parents 
again, they're just coming based on whether or not they're stuck on 128 for to get to come and get their children. Good point. Based on a train drop off at the depot. And and then on that, how long would you think, or what's the experience, um, right, with um, with the school of how long it takes to get a kid out, right? You said that someone would pull in the site, um, right, with a placard that says their name, they yeah. would be called out, but right, they're kids, they're little kids. It takes them a long time to get their act together and get distracted and da 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 da. da. So what's yeah. the, I assume, right, you guys have some experience with Wood End and the extended day and all that, yeah. like how, how long does it take to actually to, to, to get kids out the door and how long would the parents yeah. need that, you think? It, typically, um, you know, the parents are, are looking at, you seem to develop a pattern, shall we say, like in terms of Mrs. Jones always shows up at, you know, three o'clock. And, and what we do is we, you know, the kids start getting, you know, in the wintertime, as an example, you know, they put the coats on, they get ready to go. And they're kind of looking out the window, waiting for mom to pick them up because the parents are saying, all right, I'll, I'll be there. Typically, I'd say three o'clock, whatever the case may be. Um, the nice thing for us is that it's easier just to put the, the child in the car as opposed to have to ask the four COVID questions, even though they're the same questions over and over and over. Um, typically, uh, if a parent is in queue, like worst case scenario, we're using the top um, as an example. When they're in line, maybe two minutes, if that, um, if we know that there's a child, shall we say that is, has works, at, you know, moves at maybe say a snail's pace, <laughs> shall we say, uh, which all children do at different ages. We'll get them organized so that um, we'll end, when the typical time the parents are coming. Um, we'll be able to have them ready, the coats on, the hats on, and ready to go. But so, okay, honestly, no, that's good. I'm sorry. Honestly, the pickup is the easier of the two different functions. All right. Um, so, um, will there only be, at least for drop off, you don't know about pickup, but uh, only parents of the children allowed to be dropped off, allowed to drop, do the drop off? I, I'm just curious, uh, really doesn't make one, um, yeah. who, who, you know, who, yeah. in terms of who's answering those questions, like, do you really have to restrict it to parents? And I, I was just thinking about, well, you know, will some of these kids uh, uh, carpool? Um, and, sure. and, yeah, if, but, if a parent, as, because there is an actual COVID form, if a parent is not, you know, they're, they're, they're carpooling or a grandma, or aunt or whomever's dropping off the child, they would have to send us, email us the COVID answers. You know, they got to, you know, they got to send the form in to us. Mm -hmm. or the, the child, if the parent doesn't want to email it, they got to hand us, just like we're doing now, presently running a um, camp at, um, or clinic at uh, Parker Middle School. Parents walk in, the kids walk in with their form that the parents have signed, with, of which we Every day we keep them and then get, they get turned into the recreation department, which then goes to the Board of Health if we've, if anyone, um, God, we, have not, we haven't had any issues with children being sick, but it would be turned into the Board of Health so they could do contact tracing. Okay. Um, uh, two suggestions I'm going to put out there. One is that uh, inevitably, right, something's going to happen with someone. Sure. Getting either in or out of the car, kid loses a glove, has a break, <laughs> has a breakdown, like right as they're about to get out of the car or something, where a parent's going to have to pull over, right, and not keep the queue going, but pull over and deal with the the sure. situation. Um, so I, I guess I would suggest that you, you know, think about that ahead of time and make sure that you do have some, you know, and I guess I, I'd be more concerned about this the the queue up at the you know up on the top of the sheet um yeah. uh you know whether they pull around the front or you know have that planned out beforehand uh, i think yeah. on the other side it's a little bit easier having pull in one of those parking spots and deal with whatever it is they need to to, to deal with um uh in uh, in jody you had mentioned about you know signage and i think i heard you say speed bump but maybe that was just in my 
in my head because I wanted to hear you say that. Um, no. I'm, I'm no. really concerned. I am really concerned about that, uh, about the, the, um, the, the roadway on the closest to the tracks, you know, behind the, the building and knowing, oh. um, knowing that people fly down there. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and we, we did speak to the police. Right. We asked them to be more present. We love them. I know it's a private property, but they're going to let us use the signboard. Okay. If, even if, if this all goes through, they'd put it up this weekend to let people know ahead of time. Hey, FYI, children in area, let them know, train them. Um, we'll d with the speed bump should be installed tomorrow. We were hoping to have it installed today. Um, so people will see, we're going to do whatever we can. We have two people on site every day. They will continue. We, we do it all the time. We stop people. Um, if we think they're going too fast, I stop people when I see people littering in my parking lot and cleaning out their trunk you know, when they go to get a bottle of wine. So we do all of those things and we'll continue to do that with the police's help when there's a problem. So where are you thinking of, where is that speed bump going in? I think it should be, um, I can't really show on the plan, but up near the front where it says drop off door on the, um, yeah. on the so plan you, right you know there. Where, you know, yeah, you know where there's, there's a stop sign when you're coming yep. down? And where we, you know, obviously they're gonna stop at the stop sign. Uh, hopefully, but if not, <laughs> if well, yeah, yeah, probably about 20 feet further up, they would, you know, kind of where where it says door, uh, drop off door, the R, like up, up a little bit higher than that. So they stop sign, they go 10 or 15 feet, then they're gonna hit, a, they're gonna have the speed bump, and then they All right. be able to continue. I, I, I guess in my mind, what I was thinking, the 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 mm. the place to put it is right at the corner or right near that corner of the building um yeah that yeah so no 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 yeah. down down more loading yeah, dock corner. The, loading dock, the loading dock corner because that's where oh, i see there? yeah that's where i okay. see right because yeah. because they're it, right if someone comes through and they're they don't know what's going on they're from wakefield they have no idea you know uh, no, i'm not <laughs> <laughs> Not being negative about people from Wakefield, I'm just saying, you know, like someone that doesn't doesn't come to the site on a regular basis, right? They use this yeah. way as the way to get out. That's where I see, like, they're not gonna they're not gonna know that there are cars. That's the blind side. They yeah. just get, yeah, it's just blind until you like, oh my gosh, what's here? Yeah. Um, and so, so, so if I, I may, I guess, Carl, so sorry, if I may, we're actually getting two stop um speed bumps one is going to be at the front of the out we call it the alley and one yeah. will be on the back side so we'll get them going and coming okay all right and there'll be additional signage all right those were my questions yeah okay uh any any other questions from the board comments items to discuss um i have some sure unless there's something else they want to talk about outside oh uh lighting what's are, are you I, I don't know what the lighting is uh, on this side of the building is there something that you will need to do um, there's lighting on the wall there's wall pack lighting that shines onto the parking areas along this side and along this edge. And there's also lights in the front of the building. Also. Right, right. And you'll have light from inside the space. And you think that's enough for the, you know, um, once it. Once the wall packs are huge. Inside. I mean, yeah. uh, the two wall packs they have on that there's side. There's actually three wall really packs on huge. that side. Oh, is that one tucked under the eve? Oh, by the way, are you going to do something about that eve? It looks like it's going to drop ice all over people as they come in. It's falling apart. Um, I will find it's, out from... It's a safety issue. Okay. And the, the wall packs are 400 watts. Okay. Nick, you had some? Yeah, can you bring up your plan? your first floor plan. Sorry, are you looking for the inside of the, the building? 
Well, it's easier to talk to, I think, from here. Okay. But um, I, I'll start with your narrative. So you've, you've submitted this narrative that describes what it is you're trying to do. And you also submitted a, um, a code summary, I guess, which I take issue with on several points here. One is um, you're saying that there's no proposed work on any of the systems that the existing building code asks you to evaluate when you change a use or when you do an alteration. And I'm wondering where the backup is for all of that. Have you done engineering reports on these systems to show that they comply? Well, it was an occupied space in three, and A3 is a actually same hazard level as an E. So the requirement that would have been for the A3 use remains and all of the HVAC systems remain. Well, that's not necessarily true. The ventilation code and the, I mean, the IMC specifically has ventilation rates for educational uses versus a gymnasium. So, and different heating requirements as well. So I'm wondering if there's a report that says that the air handlers can handle that. And the reason I ask that is because if you are required to replace one of them or, um, or amend one, uh, append one or add one or something, then that would require some structural analysis potentially to say that there's no change in the load on that roof. Um, I saw that there was a fire alarm report, but there's nothing in here that says that the fire alarm devices meet what's required for an educational use. Um, and also I take exception with the con um, classification of this as an alteration level one. You are modifying a door and level two modification, level two alteration specifically says any change to a door or window. So you're already at level two. You're required to comply with chapter seven and chapter eight. Which doors do you think we're changing? The one that you're showing on your plan, uh, right there next to the four line, it says new door. I think there's well, a roll up door now. That's a new door that's being done prior to us going in. That's part of a- Yeah, of the, that's the, part the, of the liquor junction permit. Liquor junction has a yeah, permit a open? There's a liquor junction there that's going to be their redemption. So there's a small area being carved out there. You're talking about the small room? Yeah, there's going to be a teeny redemption room for the liquor junction. That's over by the one line. I'm talking about over by the four line. Oh. Joe, do you want to speak to that? They're putting that door in uh, because they're taking one of our egress doors away by using that as a redemption area. The that's right. To add a new Correct. Door. So they're adding a door. That's a level two right, alteration. That's not part of our permit. That's part of their permit. Did they pull a permit for that? I believe so. Len told me he was looking at it. Okay. Well, regardless, then I mean you're still changing the use, and that requires a permit. So you know you have to you have to have backup for these evaluations that you're required to do. Um, in reference, Nick, to, to jump in there and something that, you know, I'm not an engineer or um, architect or anything like that, is that um, this is Chief Jackson um, and well as um, Glenn Redman are coming to the site tomorrow at 11 o'clock to uh, do a walkthrough on that, as well as Assistant Chief Jackson has gone through the facility, as well as the director of facilities for the school, well, town, but mostly the school department, Joe Huggins, have actually gone through the site um, and they gave us their input on what was needed. Um, and uh, Huggins was, you know, like, you know, the, obviously the 25 foot high ceilings and all those things in, in terms of he outlined anything uh, that was needed um, in place. So he didn't point out anything that was outside of the code. Uh, again, the town's been tremendous. They had every single department down there to get this because of you know, the, the desperate need that the parents are struggling with, uh, with from teaching their children. So we've had all the, the department heads, I'm gonna call them the department heads at the site and gone and have given their, uh, I don't wanna say approval whatsoever, but they've, they've pointed out any issues that we, that we, they think we need to address of which we have addressed. Yeah, I don't see how that bypasses the requirement in, in 105 for a uh, building permit. Well, we're gonna know at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning when uh, Red, uh, Glenn Redmond shows up. Okay, but so is anyone doing engineering on these systems to show that they comply with the code? Is there a report? No, there is not. So 
like I said, so the fire inspection, right, the fire alarm inspection done by Tamagna de Petro, um, that shows that the alarm system is functioning, but it doesn't say anything about whether it complies with the requirements for an educational use. That's the level of engineering I think that's required. Uh, for example, the sprinkler system, right? Somebody who's a, a fire protection engineer can tell you right away by looking at the, the flow data and the sprinkler head types and whatever's in there now that it can comply with whatever hazard is presented by the educational use. It, it, <coughs> excuse me, the change of use. But that, that sort of backup hazard, information makes the project one, viable. Excuse me for one minute, Nick. The, the hazard use for a sprinkler system for both education and A3 are exactly the same when you look in the plan. Correct. They're both ordinary hazard. But Correct. there's no, no one that said that. It says that in my report. But you're not a fire protection engineer. Yeah. Well, it, and Nick, one of the things is that the, the fire department, I, I got to certainly applaud them in terms of um, Assistant Chief Jackson um, and his staff, as well as uh, Chief Burns has jumped in on this. Um, they, yes, and if I may, they've been out to the site several times. They are meeting again tomorrow. They wanted to check every device. They checked every fire alarm, yeah. fire safety, exit sign, and backup uh, fixture. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I certainly feel as though if there was a concern on their part, uh, but certainly by now they would have raised it because as Jody just mentioned, they've been out there, you know, a couple of times. They're very familiar with the site, just not just on our site, but every other tenant in there. And this is something that um, Assistant Chief Jackson, as far as I know, and I don't know if Ron's had numerous conversations with them, they have not raised these questions at all. Is that correct, Ron? That's correct. Okay. Well, what about ADA compliance in the bathrooms? There's different requirements for the different age groups. And I'm, I'm assuming that this wasn't built for the uh, pre-Ks and the K through three and the four through six. So, so grades one through six, six. Uh, fixture levels as adults. So it's when you get into the preschool and the K that you need lower, lower fixtures, shorter height toilets. K through three is actually the range. So grade one through six, which is what you're saying, would actually have lower some lower requirements in there. Do we have a, an evaluation of that? No, but we have a consultant that's looking at all of that stuff that runs the alphabet school. So is there a report for that? My, see, my concern is just that if there's a trigger that requires some work, like uh, uh, I'm looking at this plan, I'm just trying to think of what would be, be different, like, um, like work in those bathrooms requires you to pull plumbing permits. Something that delays you from just going ahead and moving in. My, my biggest concern, of course, is structural or fire protection or regress. I think you probably comply with that. Um, but that kind of evaluation is what the code requires and just don't know where the, the backup is. Yeah, uh, again, um, Nick, in terms of at 11 o'clock tomorrow when um, the building inspector, who obviously knows the code inside and out, when he goes through there, will make the adjustments that, that are necessary that he feels as though we, we need to comply with. Um, he's had all the documents as of 8.30 tonight. We, we haven't, he hasn't raised any issues with us, um, but when he does, if he does, you know, we'll address it obviously right away, but we'll know tomorrow by 11, at 11 o'clock. Um, while we're on the subject of bathrooms, are all bathrooms interior to the layout that I'm seeing here, or are they outside contiguous to other parts of the building? They're all interior to this space. Yeah. Okay. And are there any doors that would, for example, allow a child to exit this space from the interior of this plant? and maybe wander around to Liquor Junction. You're talking about from the bathrooms? From they're, anywhere well, in, within in, this in building. General, no, no they're, they're completely confined. Um, you know, obviously they're, they're, that's a state mandate. Um, a bathroom, everything's interior, uh, okay. but there's no way for them to uh, <laughs> leave the place no matter how much they want to try leaving. We won't. Okay. 
they're not going to be able to. That's fine. Thank you. Um, while we're looking at the interior, I, I'm not sure if this is a CPD, CPDC question or a building inspector question, um, but do you have enough electrical outlets for 100 kids to charge their devices? Um, I don't think they'll last all day. Yeah, Heather, that's a great question because that's one of the things we had a conversation on, on the DRT meeting from um, the fire department is that um, if you, if you look at, um, I, I don't have that. Ron, if you're able to can actually do it where it's the 22 where the, the, the little benches are, um, that area, thank you, with that area, hopefully Heather, you can see that. Um, when it was a Gold's Gym, Reading Athletic Club, they had every, uh, Billy, what was it, every two feet, there was an actual outlet. Every, every five feet, there's, there's, there's 37 outlets. Uh, for treadmills those. and all that stuff. For yeah. treadmills, electricals, the whole nine yards. Um, so that area is kind of like the supercharging station, right. if you call it that. Um, and then there's obviously outlets on the walls all throughout. Every, every six feet, there's outlets on all the exterior walls. Huh. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so we've gone through questions from um, from the board. I don't. I'm looking through the list here. I don't know. Is there anyone from the public that has questions or that are even <laughs> that are even on the Zoom? Um, I mean, I don't need you to identify yourself uh, if you are, but um, just if you have a question. I don't see any, John. I don't see any raised hands. Okay. Oh, I had one more thing, sorry. Uh, several of the references, the code references in the code summary are incorrect. So that should just be updated and resubmitted. Interior finishes, means of egress, I think they're just typos. Potentially energy conservation. Okay, I'll go through that. Thanks. Um, so I think the first thing we need to do is, um, oh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. We should also mention, right, because it wasn't, it wasn't noted before, um, that with this site plan review, there are, I'm going to, I'm just going to say a whole host of waivers that are um, uh, being requested. Um, those waivers, um, pretty much all the waivers um, are related to uh, changes uh, or are being requested because there aren't any changes to the, the building itself. Um, and so they uh, appear to me, at least, as being um, as being applicable and appropriate um, for this site plan review, which is an officially a limited site plan review. But um, since it's only due to a change of use, um, seems to be. I don't know. We've never thing. we've never waived the review fee, though, even for the nonprofits. I mean, you're going to have half the staff there tomorrow, right? We've never waived that fee before. I agree to all the rest of the stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no changes to the other yeah. stuff. But. Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't, Nick, we didn't request the waiver for for that fee uh, at all. If if you want to make it subject to us paying that waiver fee, that that's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's on the, it's in the uh, uh, draft decision. That's why I brought it up. Sorry. Yeah, Nick, you're right. We we really haven't ever waived that fee because there is a lot of um, staff time sure. that goes into um, into a review. So again, if you want to remove that from the draft uh, wording, whatever whatever you you'd call it, that that's fine with us. Right. 
Um, before we move on, right, I think we um, uh, need to close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? I hear a motion coming in. Uh, move that the CPDC close the public hearing for uh, 100 general way. Second. Um, I need to do this as a roll call, right? Um, uh, Pam? You there? You on mute? I am. Yes. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes for me. Uh, Heather? Yes. Smith? Yes. Um, and then uh, shall we go through, uh, do you want to bring up the, the draft? Um, um, yeah, Andrew can bring it up. Um, Ron, can you stop your screen share? Okay. Andrew, you have it, right? Um, Andrew, could you make that a little bigger? Yep. Thanks. Uh, so, as we know, this was triggered by a change of use for the site plan review, so we wanted to make that clear in the draft decision. Uh, we expressed a few questions throughout the draft decision, which I think have been answered here. Um, so be, uh, um, on that, um, this might be more of a, a question for Julie. If uh, at 11 o'clock tomorrow, <laughs> um, there are changes that are, are needed that, um, that may require some construction or change to the, the building, um, would those and I assume I'm going to just go right. I assume that if they're major, then you know, deals off. Um, although that's just <laughs> an assumption here. Um, uh, but I assume that if that happens, then we we may need to go through a minor modification process. Is that? I think that's possible. It depends on what the changes are. Okay. Whether they're significant or insignificant. Um, All right whether they trigger any of the site plan review thresholds. All right. I just wanted to, you know, so right as, as this is moving quickly, it, right, Nick had a lot of questions um, that may, um, may be answered by the, the building inspector because he's going through that code review himself. So um, I just want to get it out there that we still see this, you know, we're moving forward, but, you know, there's still, we may need to backtrack um, yet again, um, or not again, but backtrack um, if, if there's something substantive that needs to be done. Well, I think usually we have a section in it that says prior to building permit. Um, and I guess that was taken out under the assumption that it might not be one. But as far as right. I know, the code requires a building permit, whether the building inspector receives it, signs off on it, sends it right away back without doing anything else, it's required. So that section should be in here. Yeah, and we can try to craft some conditions. Um, yeah, you know, within reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, for example, it says bathrooms, right? There's no changes here, but I think that they should provide backup, especially if they have a consultant that's doing a, an analysis on there that confirms that no changes are required, right? Um, you know, ADA suit would be a pretty shitty thing to happen. It shut you down pretty fast. So you need to be sure on that piece of it. And same thing with life safety. It looks like the fire department's already pretty good with it, but they're going to have to sign off at some point. <coughs> the only thing messy about this is that it includes the whole site, right? When it's discussing things. Right. Mm -hmm. So, 
So you, um, Andrew, you had a couple of questions or, um, right? Yeah. Issues um, not resolved. Um, so this area was highlighted in your draft decision. I talked to Carl today to uh, confirm that the building can contain many more people inside okay. than what's proposed. So I have updated that today. Uh, if we go through, I think we've kind of addressed how queuing will be prevented uh, on Main Street uh, through the cone signage and scheduling plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the applicant feels that outside light lighting is adequate, but uh, perhaps if there is a um, report on that, we should get that. Uh, That's really confusing. So under five parking and loading, your, this site currently contains 783 spaces. Sorry, I thought you had something in here that had people. Yeah, uh, the site can, this site, I believe, can contain, based on the square footage and architectural report, about 500 people. But what does that top. mean, site? Are you talking about their space? Yes. The, All right, you have to change that. Yeah. Because the site is the site, right? You're talking about parking spaces on the site, which is the entire Danis property, right? Right. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're talking about this space. So somehow, yeah. let's clarify that. I was on the tenant space in question so that it's yeah, that's fine parking space or something like that because yeah, they shouldn't be encumbered by anything else that's happening elsewhere on the site either right right makes sense um carl and i discussed this today that the state has increased the order to about 13 children 13. for one staff ratio so uh can you address that a bit more, Carl? Yeah, the, the EEC in terms of as everyone, well, if, if you're in the, the, the child's world, shall we say, um, it, it's a moving target at all times, but the most recent one on August 28th, I believe, um, where the, the ratio now, according to the um, EEC, is uh, 13 to 1 uh, children. Um, per academic support person. Thank you. I think we reviewed, Heather asked about the outlet, which was reviewed, but Carl, you mentioned something about Verizon coming. Yep. For... Uh, Saturday between 11 and one, we're actually putting, um, uh, and, and Billy, who my, my partner, who's in the, um, IT world, we're putting in one gigabyte um, with five extenders. Billy, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we're putting a gigabit land drop into the building, so with no Wi-Fi hotspot access will be needed. We'll, we'll have a hard line into the building, so there should be plenty of bandwidth uh, for that to connect. Great, so we can update that to confirm that. this already um, in reference to the, the nurse um, we, we some of these questions were brought up by the fire department yesterday in the DRT meeting and um, we were able to get uh, an, an answer directly from the state which I did forward to um, Andrew this morning hopefully you guys were able to share that um, that a nurse is not required on site at all as well as um, the school department does not have to uh, oversee the project in terms of we're applying uh, for a direct, um, I don't know the exact word, uh, uh, an approval. Yeah, from, from the EEC. Uh, just quick background is because of everything going on, the, the state is completely overwhelmed uh, trying to get uh, these type of facilities open because you know, just in writing these 25 families that are looking to, for a place for their children. So um, they, they, they allow, especially with Alpha Best, who's a national uh, education provider, um, once we apply for the, the permit, they give you what's called a temporary uh, permit for approximately 10 weeks. And then they, um, they, they come in and, and um, give you an extended permit after the 10 weeks. 
Thank you, Carlin. I think we addressed scheduling a bit that you'll open and close consistent with the Reading Public School System and try to line up any classes as consistently as you can. And uh, I'm excuse me, Andrew, not to interrupt, but uh, Joe, do you want to touch on your meeting tomorrow at eight? Yes, uh, tomorrow morning, myself and Sandy Camandrella from uh, Alpha Best were meeting with uh, Dr. Doherty, and we had some preliminary discussions. Uh, uh, the uh, yeah, that on uh, Tuesday relative to the scheduling and so forth, but we'll get into more detail. We realized that what's going on in the Reading Public Schools is a work in progress as they move from uh, remote and then hopefully get over to, to the hybrid schedule. But we'll be, uh, we're all experienced in schools and scheduling and setting up programs. So we're gonna work hand in hand to support, really support what's going on in the schools, support the teachers, support the parents and support most importantly, the children. And you're working with the fire department uh, to get the needed materials. The permit might be needed, I believe. Uh, the fire department mentioned yeah. the BRT. Yeah, I think that's over, I forget if it's over a gallon or, or something along those lines. Gallons, some, something along those lines. Um, John, if we'd like to review the waivers now, this is um, probably the time to do so, so we, Julie and I can work on the applicant with this um, and what schedule or what construction cost okay. there is and if there is a fee, um, how that can be provided. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, so. I guess typically, right, we read through these, but since it's it's up here, it's all good, right? We have the um, waiver for providing a locust plan, um, a grading and drainage plan, utility plan, landscape plan, photometric plan, all seem sort of irrelevant. Uh, oh, and, and a drainage report, right? All those seem somewhat irrelevant um, uh, since there's no work going on right. um, uh, on the on the site. Um, related to the site. Uh, the, the traffic study, um, uh, although it, it, it could be relative, um, uh, I think that during the time, I guess my feeling on this is that with traffic down across, you sort of across the board um, and this being a temporary use when um, uh, only when there will be sort of this di disrupted um, uh, life that we live in right now, um, it, to, to have a traffic study that relies on um, traffic generation from, you know, the non-COVID world seems sort of ridiculous to do and irrelevant. So um, I, I, I'm not sure a, a good way to do that, even if we were to require it. So um, I'm, I'm all for, for waiving that requirement. So um, any discussion from the board specifically on these waivers? All right. We take a motion to approve the requested waivers? Or do we wanna wait? Well, let, uh, I guess let's finish down through mm -hmm. if we have anything, uh, any other items to discuss through here. Um, so Julie and I tomorrow can look to include a category for conditions prior to building permit if it's determined that that is needed. Um, we'd have to draft some conditions that are relevant to that topic, but. Well, I, I guess I don't necessarily want you to create conditions after the board votes, right. um, but if there are conditions that are in here that are more relevant to being in that category, um, that, that's fine. I guess I could chime in and say that, you know, we might not need to add the prior to building permit thing because they do need to get a certificate of occupancy for the use. And that's you know, all of the life safety codes will need to be met prior to that occupancy being issued. Um, and so that might, we might be able to capture it that way. And I think we can maybe add a condition right now that kind of refers to those different codes and the, the things that Nick mentioned in maybe a, a broader sense. 
Seems like a good strategy. You don't seem to have a paragraph in there for um, prior to certificate of occupancy. Do we really have that prior to occupancy? We can add that in. Um, I, I'm sorry, did I take that out? I didn't. Maybe I just didn't see it. It's at the end. Oh, I mentioned maintenance after occupancy. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oops, quickly. Yeah, that's fine. Either one. Okay. Permit or occupancy permit. that it would be something along the line that all health and safety um, infrastructure conform kind of how to wrap it all up in one condition. So it's going to happen anyway, right? You know, because the um, Assistant Fire Chief and Building Commissioner um, are going to go out to the site and review it. And they're working with a fire protection engineer from the state. Um, so, you know, maybe just saying something like, um, all life safety codes and concerns of the Building Commissioner and Fire Chief shall be satisfied, something like that. I don't know, does that capture what, what you were talking about, Nick, or do we need to be more specific? Um, well, like I said, I believe a building permit's required. So if that paragraph is missing, then you need to somehow put in the language that we usually put in for that. And so sometimes it's because they have to meet with you to deal with the construction impact. There, there shouldn't be much here, really. Right, you know, we're not doing a lot of site work. Um, even if they do have to do modifications inside, it's probably small trade, you know, small trade panel trucks or something parked in one of the spots to come in and do some work. So I do think it is a little odd to have the building commissioner issue an occupancy permit without a building permit having been applied for. Um, yeah. I think of, I can think of one other instance in which this occurred and it was a little bit of a strange thing for the building commissioner to deal with. So, I mean, we could put under here um, more something more specific related to, to that, such as a building permit shall be applied for pursuant to um, the code that you mentioned, Nick. Um, if that's building code. 780 CMR 105. And did you have a specific section that you had highlighted? Um, I mean, it's 780, 780 CMR. That's the building code. Section mm -hmm. 105 requires a building permit for a change of use, period. That's, that's what okay. it says. There's no exceptions for it. Uh, unless you're putting up a retaining wall, an oil derrick, or a, uh, what's the other thing? Something other, some other stupid little thing. I would leave it the way you had it, Andrew. No oh, headache? No, I think it's fine. You can say complied with all applicable life safety and building codes. That's horrible grammar. Where'd you go to school? <laughs> with all applicable codes. Jeez. Yeah. The applicant shall comply with all applicable like safety. Project. Codes. The project needs to comply, not the applicant. All right. I'm gonna mute myself. Yeah. Really confusing in here.
that out there. Okay, Andrew, the applicant shall ensure that the project complies, that the project complies with all applicable life, safety, and building codes. Does that sound good? And I want to ask, did the commission want to add a condition regarding the um, the cones and the spacing um, in that um, southern drop-off area? Yeah, you could say something like yeah. the, the traffic pattern shall be permanently marked so that, you know, the temporary devices can be placed appropriately. And also the spacing between the queue and the building as well, right? Yeah, I'd like to see that. And did you want to be more specific about um, where you'd like the speed bumps to go? Do you want to put that in here? Or do you feel comfortable with what's proposed? Yeah, I think there's two issues there, John, right? The police are trying to slow traffic down, and so that's their concern. But your concern was you're coming around that blind corner. Yeah. And you might have had enough time to pick up speed again between bumps. Yeah. That's a good spot for one. Coming from the west side, you're blind to the traffic. And there may not be any cars in the, you know, the outer queue, right? They may have already sort of filed out. You still go, So they won't, right. they won't have a hint of what's going on. Unless there's an objection from police or fire safety or something. Do, do we know what these are? Are these those temporary ones are just going to be picked up when they plow? Yeah, may I speak or sorry? Yeah, please do. Please okay, do. sorry. Um, I believe they are the, they're the heavy duty plastic that goes across that will come up when they plow, but then we back put back down. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I guess, to... I, I guess. I guess. Julie, my feeling is that I'm not sure that I want to put that in this because if it, for some reason, if that, if that's not working, right, and then like in a, in a, but a better space uh, somewhere else is better, I, I just, I haven't sort of thought through that and we don't have enough um, uh, detail on that that I'm comfortable putting it in here. Okay, um, so we're going to leave out the thing about you can Andrew, you can put that back. We we're talking about speed bumps. Right. Um, the traffic pattern stuff can be yeah. back in, and I would say in addition to ensuring consistent spacing, ensuring like adequate and you know the the proper spacing so the cars can make the turning movements that are needed. I think that's fine. Do we want DPW or public safety to inspect that or approve those locations? No. Okay. I think they'll be out there. Yeah. Uh, my sense is that they're going to go out and check things out at some point. Yeah, and I'm sorry. The reason why I said that, right? I don't want to be so uh, get into the bureaucracy of them having to do it and you guys having to check and da da da. Uh, right? I, I think there's enough visibility on what's happening here. Um, the client, the the uh, client, <laughs> the uh, applicant has enough. Um, y you know, uh, the last thing they want is some some one of the kids to get um, to get hurt here, right? Um, so they're going to do it right and they're going to be out there every day seeing exactly what happens. And, and I assume, right, they're going to do it once and then, you know, um, it, it may need to be modified again. So. Um, anything else on here? I'm. I'm good with the way it reads now. Um, and or with the changes that you'll you'll be making. Did you add the new plans? 
to the list of materials, Sandra? Um, I don't believe the plans that were submitted late this evening were added. Okay. Yeah, just make sure we have the revised um, circulation plan in this list. Yeah. All right. Um, any anything else, or do we should we uh, bring this for a vote? Nick Heather. No. All looks good. No, I'm all set. Um, so. And so does anyone have a motion? Uh, move that the CPDC approve the, was it site plan application? Sorry, I don't have the title in front of me. Yep, site plan yep. review application. Application for 100 general way as amended. I'll second. Second. All right, uh, with a roll call vote, go with um, Pam. Yes. Heather. Yes. Nick. Yes. Myself, yes. And Tony is, recused. I, I don't know, recused, right? I don't know if that, how that works. Just the way it did. All right, perfect. All right, so. Thank you. Good, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and thank you. I appreciate, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone. Um, I know we've trying to get something that only takes three or four months done in, in three or four weeks, and I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time tonight. And if you're looking for anything exciting, the Celtics just went into overtime. So <laughs> you <can't afford> <laughs> if you want to be able to watch the, the end of the game or something. Um, perfect timing. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Stay well. Bye -bye. You Bye -bye. too. All right. Um, next item on the agenda, if I recall correctly, was um, updates or some yeah. um, uh, so we just have like one kind of procedural thing to talk to you guys about um just like how to handle this one and then maybe like thinking about if future things like this crop up so we have a proposal um, and i don't have a lot of details i will share um the plan that i have um but we have a proposal for a covid testing tent at 30 new crossing which is the hallmark help site um and there's been some question, can you all see it? Is it all yes. showing? Okay. So there's been some question as to what kind of process we, we should look at for this. Um, we don't, so just to give a little background information, the Board of Health order back from, I forget, maybe early June that um, suspended enforcement of parking requirements under zone, or enforcement of zoning for parking requirements related only to outdoor dining. It didn't relate to like any private use of a private parking lot. Um, so that's kind of not not relevant to this and, and town council has announced that they can't make that apply to this um, or, or the board can't issue like another order. Um, and I don't really know the reasons. There's been a whole email chain. I haven't had a chance to like go through every single one. Um, but we did like think okay would we since this is kind of a slightly different use of the site but it's it's more of a temporary use and it's um it's related to an entity that's inside that wants to use the private parking lot um and it's entirely related to the fact that we're in a pandemic um would we could we do could we look at it like a minor modification that's done via an administrative approval um and so we looked at the existing decision for this property and um, talked to town council and they highlighted like a few conditions that are really, really minor that maybe we would want to modify. Um, if, unless there's 
which is fine and, and it could be done administratively, I think, and I can show you what those are if we want to talk about that in more detail. Um, or like another way we could do it is to just kind of try to establish some sort of um, process for approving like a temporary use of a parking lot that may be specifically related, like pandemic related, um, to give some flexibility so that we can respond maybe like in a little bit less of a bureaucratic way to, to things like this that seem like they would provide a community benefit and, and that kind of crop up like at the last minute. Um, as long as, I would say definitely as long as there's an internal review by staff, um, including like the public safety officials um, and engineering and things like that. So food for thought, um, this is the plan. Let me just scroll down a little and you can see the, the whole thing. Um, I don't know details such as how long. So this is, did not come to me. It's coming very indirectly to me actually. So I, I don't know the details of like how long we would wanna do this and would it be every day or just weekends or, um, and I, I, I'm lucky that I have not actually had to go to one of these sites myself. So I don't really know in general throughout the state like how these are working. Um, I've seen pictures and I've heard things but I don't, I haven't had personal experience. Um, so I welcome any feedback on what you think might be an appropriate process for this and, and potentially future things like this on private parking lots. So uh, I guess I'm going to take a, a step further back because, right, the detail, to me, the details of this particular application, um, right, that's that's one thing, but the, it's really how how do we approve a temporary use um, that's um, um, that's not related to the not necessarily commercially related, right? Even though yeah, it's a that's, commercial that's sort of related to the to the principal use, but it's a change in the site plan a little bit, um, but it's only temporary. And the thing that jumps out to me that um, that we've approved in the past and gone had them gone through a site plan um, uh, is um, uh, process is um, Home Depot, right? There, I I think there was. There's a Home Depot use um, of the of the parking lot that they use on a regular basis, um, you know, every year with the with the garden center, and we had them put you know stuff on the ground, uh, paint on the ground, and mark that off. And I, I think that works um, works pretty well. But I think at the same time they had come to us, and I forget whether it was that parking lot or the the Jordan's parking lot where they were requesting, you know. Uh, a long, sort of a longer term, but yet temporary use of displaying cars or, or mm -hmm. I, I forget exactly what it was. Um, they bring in that, they bring in that trailer that does some sort of experience, right? Oh, that, yeah, 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 that's what it was. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, and so, uh, you know, on the face of it, on the face of it, you know, right, the Jordan's parking lot, uh, um, you know, actually, Tony's probably the, the closest neighbor. Um, uh, you know, it's not right in front of any, anyone, but, you know, we, we also learned that, um, you know, there's other parking lots that have, even if it's, you know, the, one was public, but, right, th these, some parking lots can have a big impact on how they're used um, uh, to, on, on, lots of neighbors and I'm hesitant to just have changes um, to uses, albeit temporary without any sort of public process um, or at least the possibility of public input. Um, Cause although to me, although this one may be fine and really it's all related, um, you know, what happens if um, I, I'm just gonna, randomly pick, you know, some other property, some other parking lot like the, uh, I'm calling it Mass Bank, but it's, uh, it's Eastern Bank, right? Um, and they want to do something um, right there in the middle of downtown um, that's somewhat similar, 
And that one, you would say, of course, that gets reviewed. So what's the threshold of review? And that's what I'm um, having a hard time with, with, with not having a public process. No, that's good. That's really good. Um, Cause you're right. Like the, there are impacts that will extend beyond just the parking lot. Right. So, and, excuse me. I need to go get a plug for my computer. <laughs> um, anyone else have any comments or should we just wait for John? To come well, I, we can wait for him to come back, but I, and I actually really appreciate what he just pointed out that this one is pretty obvious, you know, and if, even in this one, I mean, if the restaurant industry were doing better now, I'd worry about uh, impacts to the parking at the restaurants nearby. But, you know, given the current situation, that may be less of a concern. So it just seems like we do need to be cognizant of um, temporary changes to parking lots do affect parking, even for uses that are really needed, like uses that are related to the pandemic. Yeah, I think if we looked at it from a use standpoint first, right? So what is it that they need to do? This is reacting to some emergency need. Yeah. Um, it's not a, it's a private company. So it's, it's not like it's not commercial, but it's not commercial in the sense that a restaurant needs to put some stuff outside or wants to put some stuff outside or Home Depot is doing a rug sale, right? It's like there's a clear line between that. Some community benefits, some community need, let's say town hall burns down or something and we need to provide some sort of support. We could put up a tent on the green, you know, and serve it from there potentially, something like that versus a, a obvious commercial sale of goods somehow or services. This is, I understand this is a profitable uh, industry here, healthcare, but they still are serving some need it goes beyond that. Where else can you go? Yeah. Um, and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, I think staff is, uh, I understand John's concern with there being some sort of public oversight of this, but you can look at this site plan and realize there isn't a residence. Tony can't see this site. How's that? You can't see the base of this building, right, Tony? Uh, actually, I can't. I can't see the base. I can't see the building. Yeah, I can't see the base of the building. Uh, so that's sort of obvious thing, right? Uh, so is proximity to abutters and abutting uses a, another threshold? Yeah, absolutely. I've always yeah. been a you know proponent of making sure that that edge gets addressed anyways. Um, and that's the public process that John's talking about. Yeah. If there were residences, even, even just off the page here, if there was a residential neighborhood, you know, there was a, it's 20... 25, 75, it's almost 100 feet away, right? That bottom edge there, when you get past all that parking, that's still impacted by something that's going on here. Let's say this runs 24 hours right. a day. So if we can't come up with that line, if we can't figure out how to distinguish between those obvious commercial uses and some emergency community need, then I think the whole, all of it has to go through the public process. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a long public process. No. So um, I guess that brings up a, like the question of like how flexible are you and to be able to have like an impromptu meeting if we just did tonight. I mean, tonight's was a plan, planned out a little bit, but like if we needed to respond quickly to something like this, if you wanted to have a process, I mean, you, we would want to notify abutters to some degree. Um, minor modifications, like if this, if we did the minor modification to the approval, the site plan approval for this, it, you know, technically it doesn't, it's a site plan, right? It's not statutory. It doesn't come with a requirement that we have a public hearing or that we give 14 days notification. Typically that's what we do anyway. Um, and minor modifications, um, even less, there's even less of a requirement. But, you know, we tend to kind of keep things the same just because, like, the public is an integral component of everything that we do. Um, so that we can, like, with a site plan decision modification, we can have flexibility on that, that though, because it's not tied to a statute. Yeah. 
I mean, sorry, it's a lot wrapped into that. That was with the minor modification. I'm just trying to make sure I understand. So it's, it's with site plans in general um, and minor modifications. Um, well, so we treat them all the same. We treat them as the same way that we treat special permits, that we treat a subdivision. We do it all the same way. Um, we're not required to, though, by law with site plans. So the, the point there really, I think, Julie, is we don't necessarily need to give um, uh, two weeks um, public notice on, on things. We do because we feel that's the right thing to do, um, but there's no requirement to do that. And I guess I, I, I'm of the, I guess I'm of the opinion, although I'd rather, I'd rather not, I think I, I'm of the opinion that on things like this, um, that the right thing to do is to have a, I don't want to call it impromptu, but a special, a, a special scheduled meeting, um, specially scheduled meeting. It doesn't typically wouldn't need to be long. I mean, this one was longer than I think, um, than, than the, the one tonight was longer than it would be for reviewing something like this. I would hope that we'd be able to review this in you know, a half an hour. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I, I guess I, my personal feeling is that um, providing that public input is part of the, the job for us. Um, so although I wouldn't want to have to do this on a frequent basis, and hopefully this will be over soon, um, meaning the pandemic um that I, I think this personally i think this is our i'm not sure another way to do it i'll put it that way yeah but, i'm I, i'm ha i can I, I don't i can't speak for everyone but i'm i'm okay having these short notice kind of emergency meetings for projects that i might classify as covid oriented solution projects So, um, okay, I haven't, I will have to coordinate a little bit. Um, we did have a meeting tentatively scheduled on the 21st, which we were, we actually were thinking we might not need, um, but we could try to queue this up for that, which would give us time to give like a one week notification to abutters, um, which is we did a one week notification for the, um, the project that you guys just talked about. Um, and then we also asked the prop the Danis property management company to let the other tenants in the building know. Um, John, and while you were off camera, I was just trying to say that if there's a if there's a clear line that differentiates between this specific type of need, right, this sort of community emergency service, mm -hmm. even though it's commercial, from yeah. a blatantly commercial, you know, rug sale or restaurant. And I'd be okay personally with letting town deal with this. You're going to look at this, Julie, and, and uh, Andrew, you're going to look at this from a traffic management and parking issue. Safety is going to look at it from access to the building, not blocking off the, um, the Siamese connection, which is just up the, the face of this building, you know, things like that. And we know it would be done right. I don't, I don't need to look at this one to say that they could approve this administratively. So if we could figure out where that line is, that's easy. I'm in agreement with that, Nick. Yeah, like I don't, I, this to me doesn't present any big heartache. Um, you know, I think once they figure out the details um, and and I have faith that, you know, um, Julie and Andrew and, and others could review this administratively um, uh, and come up, you know, right, that the answers would be this, all the same, right? We'd all, everyone in this would, everyone in this meeting would come up with the same answers on here. Um, uh, and it doesn't have a big community impact, negative community impact. It, it hopefully, well, I hope there isn't a real big need for, for this, honestly. Um, but yeah, if we if we can draw that line between this and, like you say, a rug sale, um, I, I'm all ears. I, I'd be I'd be more than pleased to to um, figure out how we can approve this, but um, but have the other come to us you know we could also um just have a case by 
So it doesn't have to be, you know, one standard process. I could get yeah. information and send it to a couple of you guys and then you can let me know what you think and then we can figure it out as we go. Like we haven't had a lot of, um, so we have this one, which is a private lot. And then there is talk of a potential flu clinic down at the Brandy Court lot, but that's a public lot. And so it's a little bit of a different process um, that we're still also working out the details of. Um, but we haven't, it's not like we're getting a lot of requests for things like this. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to just kind of take them as they come to try to figure something out. That's another way to do it. Um, so that we don't have to like right now, tonight, decide where that line yeah. gets on. Um, you know. The only issue I would have is that the line to me is the timing. Somebody wants to have a rug sale that lasts a weekend and a few extra days, that's a totally different from somebody setting up a testing tent for four months. Yeah, I, and that, I, I, I would think the, of that too, right? I would so. think the inverse of that, right? So that some long-term sale, you know, rug sale tent, to me is more, uh, causes more impact than this because this is there's this sort of impending need. You're right, but I can't come up with something that's objective that says, in this case, yes, in this case, no. My first instinct would be to say time-wise. Yes, a four-month rug sale absolutely needs to go before a site plan review. A one-week rug sale? You know, uh, or a rug sale every weekend for three months is different than a one-time event, different from a event that lasts every day for four months. And it's going to become worse probably next year as more and more restaurants decide that the only way that they're going to make money is in the summer by having outdoor dining. What about... So, uh, what about no, F you. I, well, I... No, I, I I'm, I'm not quite there, but what about something like this, where like, the rug sale that might go on for months or happen every weekend or months, for months, and even a restaurant, that's basically an extension of an indoor service expanding to the outdoors. And to me, that's why it's like, all right, that, that takes a review. Okay, now, a COVID testing tent is also kind of expanding service to the outdoors, but it's something where, well, see, this may not work either. Um, where you know there's there's a there's a direct health related reason to have people drive up and drive through and get out of there. I don't know. Is there a line that can be drawn there about between commercial retail services basically expanding space to the outdoors on a more than one weekend basis, and something that is directly related to um, providing say health services for the COVID pandemic? that we tolerate as long as the pandemic lasts? Yeah, that's a good point because if they were doing this, say, um, to hand out vitamins or something, you know, I can't think of some non The CVS where, yeah, you know, wanted yeah. to extend it to, yeah, have uh, get, get Zyrtec out to everybody. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I could, that's the line. So we know it when we see it, right? We just can't seem to define it. It's, it's that. And I guess I'm trying. Going I'm, I'm trying really hard. <laughs> this whole discussion, right, is about trying to be um, trying to. Uh, I don't want to say be fair because we're always fair, um, but uh, be predictable in in terms of what gets reviewed, what comes to the board, and what gets reviewed administratively, right? I mean, that's what uh, that's what this discussion is about. Predictable and fast, right? This needs to move quickly. Right. So Julie and Andrew need the tool. They need. They can't have us in the way. Right. right. And, and to me, to, I guess to me, thinking about it, if it's public health related, um, the default should be um, it should be that it gets addressed administratively. Um, I'm. I'm. And Julie, maybe this is what the the line is, um, unless. Um, you see a, um, in, in your estimation, you see uh, uh, an impact on the community that you think needs uh, public input. Okay. 
and then I could always. We, I'm sorry. By you. We do that uh, on other uh, on other minor modifications yeah. as well. Is you know when you're not um, comfortable that it's it doesn't that it it's not clearly um, right for for administrative review. You bring it out. So, but yeah. I, I guess I would leave it at public health related items. I, I guess I'm not there yet on the um, on the the rug sale or the even the um, the restaurants that um, that come next summer may want to start doing things more outside. I, I I guess I feel like we need to think that through a little bit more on um, what that right process is. But to me, that's not quite as urgent um, as this is. Yeah, that being I, the restaurant versus this that needs to probably be done in a couple of weeks. If we're if we're writing anything down about that um, that um, that criteria, which I think is a good one, we might even want to say that it's directly public health related. I mean, I could I could yeah. see one making a a fairly compelling argument that outdoor dining, which I really like. Um, so, but outdoor dining or even outdoor retail is also public health related because it's keeping people healthy. So this might want to specify that, you know, a kind of a direct public health service um, that that we hope can be, be addressed administratively unless it looks like there's going to be impacts to uh, of others. Yeah, I think that we, under, I, I, can, I understand what you're getting at when you say public health related or I, I get what you're saying with that. I, um, and we can craft it that way. Um, I'll, I'll write something up about this. Um, and then, I mean, I, I do like tend to reach out to John a lot when I'm like not sure about things. So I'll continue to do that as much as I feel like is needed. Um, and, oh, I want to say one other thing. So it's not just Andrew and I working on this either. It's the whole parking traffic transportation task force that would review it. There's, a, which includes like a wide, wide range of staff from many different departments in town, um, management, planning, economic development, public safety, engineering, DPW. You want so, us to name them all every time we want to say you and Andrew? <laughs> no, I just I want for the public to bring you and it's, it's not yeah. it's it's really I'm not like um um I don't know a good way to say it. I'm not the one decide making the ultimate decision on this people. So it's looking it's being looked at from all angles. Um so Julie, we're in a state of emergency right now, correct? And hard to keep track of that moving target. Um, I think, you know, I don't really know if the state extended it. Probably they did. Because um. I, I think the simplest thing might be that um, any type of change, such a temporary change, such as this, may be approved by staff during a state of emergency. So, but, but any any temporary public health related thing like this? Well, uh, you could have a state of emergency for flooding, snowstorms as well, but it would have to be related to the state of emergency to offset the state of emergency or to ameliorate or something to that effect. What do you think about that? Well, I think, right, um, I, uh, I think that works. Um, but in essence, right, we're just trying to give you guidance, Julie, on when you should be thinking about trying, uh, when, you, when you're talking to these applicants, when you should be guiding them towards uh, the, um, or alerting them to the fact that the board is going to want a public hearing, and so setting them up for that versus um, versus something that you can do administratively. Um, but but we collectively have that. I'm going to say already have that power to to decide one versus 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 the other because I do think that right there there already are 
um, administrative rules put together on what you can approve administrative, uh, administratively. And this, I think, complies with that. Um, yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, you're yeah. just looking for, you just wanted sort of a, a, a little bit additional guidance on where that line is for what something, is, right? What about being really specific? Yes, I just looked it up. We're still in a state of emergency. Um, I guess I'm also a little bit reticent to say, okay, during a state of emergency, we can approve all, you know, all of whatever, because everything that's going outside is because of our state of emergency and the, the limits on indoor use and all that. What about just being really specific about medical, saying medical services? I mean, this is a medical service. I think almost anything we can envision might be a medical service. Is that too narrow for you? I mean, I think I, I, I'm, I'm getting that you get what we're talking about, so. I'm, I'm happy with whatever you guys decide. I mean, definitely um, saying medical services. Um, I mean, just like a flu clinic is medical service. It's all medical services to- Yeah, but something like a food kitchen or something providing uh, supplies like critical supplies. Yeah. So it might not be, it might not necessarily be health, but it, as true. Tony was saying, related to the particular crises. Yeah. Public health and public service. So Julie, you have what you need. What you have some good guidance there? Yeah, I think so. Right. I mean, like I said, it's not. Um, I, I I understand the clear distinction between a, a commercial expansion to an outdoor space and a medical related, um, pandemic related uh, service, kind of like like this. Um, and it's not like these things are banging down my door. I mean, right. that definitely yeah. might change. And and to the point that was made about um, outdoor dining and all of that, that definitely needs to be uh, thought about in a little bit different way and, and staff are working on it. And we're, we're also working on trying to figure out a better process for temp, a, a better approval process for temporary outdoor events. So like, like that don't fall necessarily on a private site, but that aren't all, are also aren't really considered a civic function. So, kind of those in between things like the um, the sidewalk sale or you know, things like that. So it's something that we're working on to try to help streamline um, stuff for you know the spring. So if you have any Great thoughts, let me know. Yeah. All right. So I mean, I can show you like to give you an idea of the conditions of this permit that would need to be slightly modified. Uh, it, you'll see kind of how administrative it, it really is. Um, I'll show you really quick. Um, can you all see it's like an email and they're highlighted. So um, you know, making sure the exterior areas of the site remain clear of de debris, equipment used in connection with commercial activity. Um, that really is kind of getting at something else, um, in my opinion. And then ensuring the required parking spaces are accessible at all times. And that's more about snow, snow impeding the ability for people to use them. Um, but definitely, obviously, Hallmark Health will still need to have employees there that need to park. So, you know, making sure that circulation plan works and that some of the parking spaces are still available for their employees would be important. Um, and then just restricting the use to Monday through Friday. Um, and this might need to happen on the weekend. So that would be modified, but it's, it's really just, um, mm -hmm. they're just like small things like this. Um, and, any administrative approval that I put together would be limited in time and would specifically related to the, the COVID testing tent and the pandemic um, so that it would help to prevent from like, uh, like opening the door to like any sort of future other use of the parking lot. Um, 
that may actually warrant a different type of review or review by you guys. Um, so. That's good. All right. Um, are we good with this conversation? Okay. And are there minutes, Andrew? Did, um, I got through like half of this, honestly. Um, I didn't realize that. I mean, if you see anything, just call it out. You'll see yeah. a highlighted area. I was able to fill that in on the number of parking spaces that were changed and the drive aisle width that was changed uh, in terms of the 531 Main Street project when you get that far. Um, uh, Andrew, go to the top of the page. Um, oh shoot, what page are we on? Page four. Page four. Sorry. It's okay. Mr. Uh, Safina approved. Should be uh, moved to closed the meeting and motion to approved. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so you got the spaces. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that was all I had. Other than if you go to file properties. Yeah, good, show us this. File update. File, uh, let's see, file. All right, general. No, that's options. Not see file. properties. All right, you see the properties on the right hand side? I do not. Keep going. I mean, move here. Yeah, right there. It's the yeah. right column. Yes. Yeah. So school agenda. Ah. Uh, Beautiful. Wonderful. You can also remove Mr. Finnegan from the uh, list of the author. Sweet. Few last names mentioned or missing. Truly, do we have a sign-in sheet on Zoom? I think when I looked at the video, it didn't really show the whole participants. Yeah, I have. Um, so. I have Tyler's last name. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I have it. Okay. Um, worst comes to worst, we can maybe remove them. Just remind me tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Come on. And after Brenda, you have Eric. Nope. Oh, and actually, Eric is Eric Tate's K A T Z. Okay, I had him above as well. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh, there's another Eric. Never mind. Double check on that. Okay. You know what you could do in the future to catch everybody who's there is ask, um, especially like, members of the public to just type their name into the chat 
and then you've got just just for the minutes then you've got the accurate right. record good idea well you recorded the meeting you you can't look at that and see who attended i couldn't find a way to see the participants tab on the recording we'll do a screenshot next time as well yeah that's what i was thinking well it shows up too as the name people use for their device a lot of times right so like sometimes it, it's a partial name or their spouse's name or something like that. That just right. gives you creative license to do whatever you want with the name. <laughs> <laughs> Chatty person. So, so I, I, I just wanted to alert you guys to something because I see on the screen that ANR for Sanborn Lane, which some of you I stopped oh. by your house just to have sign. Um, they made a typo on it. And have oh, to no. read. So I'm going to be coming around again. All I right. got the mylars today. It's yeah, they the, the, the numbers of the addresses. Um, so they just had to fix it. So nothing ever fully gets off the list, off the to-do list. <laughs> so. All right, anyone else with um, comments, with edits? I don't have any. Nope. Okay. Motion to accept the minutes from August 8th, uh, August 10th, as amended. A second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 We can do that, right? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I think that just wanted to quickly mention um, that meeting that we had tentatively scheduled for the 21st. Um, it looks like we're not going to need it. Um, yeah, it's some of the things we thought might be submitted this month were not. So. Um, we have a big agenda for Monday night, though. Yep. Um, <laughs> there was one other thing I was going to mention that I can't think of right now. The sign oh, lawsuit in the cool. ACLU. Oh. Oh, yeah, I mean, I guess I could mention that. So we're being told to stand down on enforcement of political signs. Um, to stand down on what? Enforcement of political signs. Oh. Um, so we updated for those of you new to the commission um, we updated the sign by law i think it was in 2017 to make it more constitutional um because we can't regulate signs based on content um and we have recently been told by town council that we didn't quite get there with that because like for example oh dear for us to know that a political sign is too big, like if, if the sign itself is too big, some signs are too big, right? And and the, and to enforce the timing of um, two days or 60 days before an election up until two days after, we have to read the sign and and determine the in that category of political sign. So that's just kind of one example of why and we're not supposed to have to read the sign to enforce the sign by law. Um, and there are some sign by laws that have recently been challenged in court, um, political sign um, challenges that have lost. Um, so, but you can look at something and decide it's a structure that is unsafe. So somebody takes it four by, you know, four by eight sheet of plywood with some paint on it, whatever, whatever, doesn't matter, and stakes it into their front lawn. They could be creating blocking a sight line or it could tip over into the public way, things like that could fly off right in a windstorm. You can make a determination that the structure is unsafe, right? Can't have an accessory right. structure in your front yard. So, so this also, this creates a problem also, or is there a designation there that, um, uh, what about all street signs and signs compliant with MUTCD I have to look at those signs to tell them, and I need to read the sign to tell it whether it's a commercial message or a 
or a non-commercial message. Um, and if we can't, I mean, that's a problem, right? Like they, they can't, right? They need to resolve that because you, you, we can't allow just people to put up signs like they can, like MUTCD signs. So MUTCD signs would not like, street signs that are no, but John's suggesting that somebody makes a fake one and puts it right. in their lawn saying "Do not enter" or kind of like that to stop traffic on their street. Yeah. Right. No. No. I get or, what John's getting at. Um, or a sign that's that's consistent in every way. Right. It nice little diamond yellow reflective sign, but instead of saying you know curvy road ahead, it says the <laughs> name of a business or, you know, and like everyone can just put up those signs wherever they want. So I, I, I want to, I, I would be really Great. interested in reading whatever the legal opinion is on this just to understand. So is the issue, is the legal issue that because one has to look at a sign to determine that it's a political sign that therefore it, you're bringing a subjective nature to it and that's unconstitutional. It, it's not just that a sign with the name of an elected official, which I mean, a, a candidate for office, which is pretty objective. I urge you to read the Supreme Court decision, which provided no guidance and no- I, Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd, love to, I'd love to read it. I can e either find it or if somebody has a second to send it to me, I'd be really curious about it. So the heart of the matter is that we can't regulate, regulate based on content, right? And so oh. we can regulate based on size and location and timing and all those kinds of other parameters. But if we have different parameters for different types of signs, then we have to read the signs to figure out which parameters to enforce. And then in a sense, we're, we're regulating based on content. I thought all of our temporary signs were one size. I thought we eliminated that. We said. This is what you're allowed for temporary signs. This no bigger our, than this. Yeah. Our, no, we have temporary signs for special events, a uh, sale of a subdivision, a political, uh, an election, um, a graduation. They're all broken. They're all broken down into separate categories, and some of the parameters are. I, I'm not. I I shouldn't have brought this up because I can't speak to it super eloquently. Um, but. I've told you basically what I know for right now. So just prohibit all signs. Yeah. Prohibit all signs. Like they do in Sweden, right? Or in yeah, I think that's Sweden. Places that do it, no signs. Period. No signs. I mean, that sounds great. We've talked about just getting rid of the signs a lot. And other times you guys haven't really been in favor of that. We should get rid of the lawyers, is what we need to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> um so that's that. Okay, so we have to take that up at some point to fix it. Is that what you're know. saying? We don't know. Can we get our money back from? We need to fight it out first, right? Well, can yeah, we get think... can we get money back from our lawyer who said that our bylaw was okay when we wrote it? I pushed hard on that. Not about the money back piece, but I'll um... send my uncle Vito down. <laughs> and I, I lost back. that argument. Um, and you were served with a letter um, from someone from uh, with an appeal to claim, and told we were told to just totally stand down. So anyway, um, I'm trying to think of what else. I'm sure it'll come to me as soon as the meeting's over. But then we're gonna I'm gonna see you on Monday. So it'll be great. I'll tell you then. All right. Uh, it's 9.58, let's end this before 10. <laughs> Can we do that? Anyone have parting words? Motion Thoughts? to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you all for accommodating this. Thank you. Thank you. Soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Well, he's done.